All right. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to Healthy Living Live. I'm Chef AJ, and my guest today is Dr. Vera Tarman. She is the author of a wonderful book called Food Junkies. Would you like to hold it up, Dr. Tarman? Because I only bought it on Audible. It's really the best, if not one of the best, books ever written on food addiction. She's also the medical director of the Renaissance Drug and Alcohol Treatment Center. So thank you so much for being here again. You're really one of my favorite people to interview and talk to because you have such a a depth and breadth of knowledge on this subject. And really, you're one of the only experts that is also a actual real doctor, a medical doctor. So I appreciate your expertise as well. Thank you. I'm really glad to be back again. Oh, you're welcome. People just love, love hearing from you. So we can, depending on what people ask, I can read the comments and possibly take questions. But one of the things I wanted to talk about today, and I think we touched on in our last interview, but we didn't really dig deep, is the use of drugs, other drugs, other than we, we both, you and I consider sugar and flour pretty powerful drugs. Absolutely. But other drugs, whether they're prescription drugs, like maybe psychiatric medications, or even medical marijuana, or non-prescription drugs that people take recreationally, like tobacco and alcohol, mm -hmm. vaping, pot, or tobacco, and how the use of these drugs, well, we know that they're not health promoting, but how they specifically affect people that identify as food addicts or specifically sugar addicts. I'm very surprised, Dr. Tomer, and maybe you see this at your center too, how many people, they just wanna lose weight. They don't care about getting healthy, but especially the female, they want to lose weight. And they'll do all kinds of radical things like mutilate their body through gastric bypass or put those little tubes up their nose. And uh, But they're not interested in getting healthy. And it shocks me because my program, I do run one in person, but it's largely run online. And how many people come there with cross addictions or other addictions that they're not willing to give up? So they're, they're smoking cigarettes, not realizing that there's sugar in cigarettes. They have uh, a multi-can-a-day diet soda habit, diet Coke habit. Uh, they're they're using marijuana either recreationally or or with a prescription vaping it at night for other conditions like insomnia or anxiety and so my question is and I'm not trying to make these people feel bad because I think everybody's an addict to one thing or another but mm -hmm. my goal is they're if they really are trying to lose weight and especially trying to get healthy how the use of these other drugs affects the the person with with food addiction or sugar addiction so take it away Dr. Tarman. Okay, well, I mean, that's a really, really broad area. Um, there are um, a number of different, you, you've covered a lot of stuff. So there's the, the prescription medication and then there's the non-prescription medication. Um, a lot of people will uh, smoke cigarettes so that they don't eat. Uh, and, you know, I guess they justify it because it is true that um, uh, smoking cigarettes will suppress appetite and typically people will gain up to 10 or 15 pounds when they quit smoking. Uh, and part of that is the actual suppression of ni nicotine on appetite. But a lot of it is the pattern of uh, just putting something in your mouth all the time. Um, uh, so that's that's uh, one thing. But as you pointed out yourself, cigarettes have um, some amount of sugar in it. I've, I've seen anywhere from just a little bit to up to a teaspoon of sugar. It's, I, I don't know exactly how much, but it's enough to continue to it, um, uh, promote and pro prolongate the sugar cravings because when we talk about addiction what we want to do is it's not about weight loss everybody can lose weight when they're motivated it's not about weight loss it's about feeling comfortable with it, whatever at the weight you're at or at the weight that you've lost so that you don't pick up and go back to eating that stuff at some point later in the in the day because what's the point of losing weight for three or four pounds a months only to get it back again. So really the, our focus, yours and mine, is to um, uh, relieve the obsession wanting to eat the stuff in the first place. If you don't have the obsession, you don't do it. Uh, and then therefore the weight doesn't come on. So if you uh, uh, t smoke a cigarette which promotes the addictive cycle, you're just gonna wanna eat or smoke uh, and you're not getting rid of the itch. That's the thing that we're trying to take care of. Um, so that's why cigarettes don't work. But, you know, in the extreme end, people will take, um, uh, at the very extreme end, if they're already using drugs like cocaine, they, they'll be afraid to stop using it because it suppresses appetite. But more typically, what people do in the sort of functional world is they use medications that have the stimulant effect. And that might be something like Vyvanse. They go to their doctor, get diagnosed for attention deficit. I'm sure that you've, you've experienced this yourself uh, uh, in your own 
counseling part of your practice that when people are on sugar, their attention is all over the place. It's not that hard to get a diagnosis of attention deficit. Um, Absolutely. So you get the drug Vyvanse or something like some kind of stimulant drug, which is targeted for the attention deficit. But what does it do? It suppresses appetite because it's a stimulant. It's not any different really than cocaine, except it's like a lo super, super long acting cocaine. Uh, it'll suppress appetite and make you feel good. So you don't need the sugar. Um, it's essentially a kind of sugar, but quicker. It's a quicker acting sugar. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like that. Um, <laughs> so so um, taking that drug, people will want to take that to avoid that. But if you want to get off of that because you want to sleep, you don't want to be anxious, then the appetite comes back again. Um, so it's not a great, it's a temporary solution, but not a great long-term solution. Um, uh, so that's sort of the, and then there are some antidepressants that have a slight, um, uh, it's not really speedy, but the, it's not, it, it, it's, they have an appetite suppressant effect as well. And if you stop taking them, then you have the same problem. Uh, so there's the, the prescription medication, which either puts the problem off until later, or you have to stay on them forever, or it makes the problem worse. So that's, that's that. But then there's the whole um, other area where people are, um, I don't know, I mean, part of the focus of today's talk is to talk about meds and stuff like that, right? I got, I, sorry, I got a bit lost in what we were, what was your initial question? So my initial question is how do the use of these either prescription or non-prescription recreational drugs affect somebody who is suffering from food addiction or sugar addiction? Okay, thank you for getting me back on track. So, That's okay. Yeah, so, so taking a stimulant um, can uh, affect you because it can suppress your appetite, but then you're stuck on it forever and it, and, and it doesn't work for that long anyway. So there's that piece. And then, by the way, when you're taking those stimulants, you can't sleep at night. You eventually get um, agitated and anxious and irritable. And you have to take a high enough dose, you actually even get paranoid. It's, it's, it's um, the same kind of thing as uh, drugs, but just uh, much slower. Um, now, if you're on other meds like antidepressants or even antipsychotics, which which um, most of us who take antipsychotics are not actually, we're not psychotic. It's actually used as a form of anxiety management or as a drug to add on top of a, a cocktail of mood management disorder drugs. And um, uh, antipsychotics are real culprits for affecting the sugar profile um, I mean, they essentially make us pre-diabetic and how, how that feels is uh, it makes you crave sugar um, and people gain a tremendous amount of weight uh, because they're craving sugar. They're eating a lot more sugar um, and they're also um, really affecting their sugar profile in their blood. Antipsychotics are, I think, um, in the top five drugs that are prescribed in America and Canada today. Like they're widely prescribed, not because we are a psychotic nation, but because we are an anxious and depressed nation and they're being used in that way. They're considered safer than benzodiazepines and previous pills that we used for sleep. Um, so they're used a lot. They're used almost almost to a T everybody in prison, um, in many treatment centers, and now more and more in the regular population. And what are we seeing? We're seeing people eating beyond what they would normally eat just because of the medication. That's antipsychotics. Antidepressants have a similar but not as strong effect. And if a person is uh, on meds and finding that they're gaining weight or that they have started to eat in a pattern that's more, you know, choosing, choosing the simple carbs and sugars as opposed to regular food, healthy foods, um, uh, it's probably because the meds are skewing their desire for that. So there's that. Um, I know that one of the things I definitely want to talk about, but maybe you have, do you have other questions first? I want to talk no, about- No, no, will you could please, this is such an important topic. I mean, I'm taking notes as you talk and maybe we'll have a few follow-up questions, but please. this is a very important subject for people to understand. One of the things that I'm really worried about um, uh, is uh, the whole uh, marijuana, medical marijuana, recreational. I mean, now medical marijuana is, is something that we're dealing with. But soon in the summer in Canada, we're going to be dealing with recreational marijuana. Oh, boy. 
So it's going to be an even bigger issue. And, and uh, I mean, I, as an addictions doctor, I'm worried about that from the, um, uh, just the addiction point of view, the young and, and that whole piece. But even outside of that, even if you say, uh, hey, don't worry about it, we'll just use the cannabinoids, which are the sort of, quote, health, healthy marijuana, mm -hmm. the medical piece of marijuana. It's not THC, is the stuff you get high on. And, you know, we can get some kind of marijuana that's less on the THC, psychoactive, take more on the cannabinoid one and two, it's the healthy thing. Um, but those also uh, create appetite. I mean, that's often why people take them because they're supposedly on uh, chemotherapy or some kind of medication and have low appetite and need something to stimulate appetite, which we of course call munchies if we're using it recreationally. It does actually affect um, the brain and um, stimulates appetite uh, in a way that if you don't have an illness like cancer or HIV, um, and you don't actually require stimulation, um, you will eat and it'll be the kind of food that's not good for us. So I'm worried about um, not only the addictive potential uh, that will be introduced in the summer, but also just the uh, obesogenic nature of this drug that people think is funny, but we got, a, we got an obesity problem already. Uh, just what's going to happen in a year or two or three or four, eating, uh, um, eating, smoking, vaping, whatever way you want to do it, um, a drug that will actually stimulate your appetite more than we already are deal dealing with. Because we're living in a toxic food environment, which is already um, overstimulating our appetite. I think I better turn down all my stuff. Maybe you have your notifications turned on or turn something. That's okay. Yeah. It just means I don't hear you as well. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> that's okay. We're good. All right. Yeah. So that's how, you know, there we go. There's, there's my concern about marijuana. And I'm sure that there'll be some questions about that. Yeah. yeah. Some people are saying that they got the munchies when they, marijuana. Yeah. Um, what, uh, Katharina says she didn't get ap more appetite, but depression, oh. even on the no THC. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, you mentioned that, that people are anxious and depressed. And, uh, you know, what I see is that the foods that they're eating, like the sugars and the flours, are actually making them more depressed. Yeah. You know, so you mentioned how they give antipsychotics like M&Ms in prison. I actually volunteered at a prison once. Oh and the God. food that these inmates were served, uh, you know, I wouldn't feed my dog. I mean, it was it was not just sugar and flour like like your your grandma making an apple pie sugar and flour. We're yeah. talking the absolute worst processed crap that you would find like at a gas station, you know, a mini mart. Like I actually once for for teaching purposes, 10 years ago, I bought one of those cinnamon rolls mm -hmm. at the, the AMP and mini mart. It's perfect condition. 10 years later, it's edible. It's perfect. Oh, and, you know, wow. so, so they're giving them these people yeah. drugs and so many people aren't, aren't exercising or doing anything else to treat the anxiety and depression. And yet the foods that they're eating are perpetuating their anxiety and depression. So it becomes sort of like a vicious cycle. You know, yeah. I love what you said about you and I, our job is to get rid of the itch. Uh -huh. And it's that so many people want to keep scratching, but are looking for a way to not have the, you know, the wound oh, become infected. You know, they're, they're, yeah. they're approaching it from the wrong angle. Yeah, that's a good way. They, they, yeah. uh, they're they trying to, they're, they're, they're trying to get rid of the rash, but still keep the itch because it's fun feeding the itch. Um, absolutely. But it, it actually isn't after a while because that itch gets worse and worse and worse. And, you know, using that analogy, you just think about somebody who has a, a bee sting or a, or, a, or a mosquito bite. After after a few weeks of scratching that thing, you've got a major ulcer and it hurts. And that's mm -hmm. what happens. That's essentially what addiction is, is it's gone to that edge of now it's this weeping ulcer and it's not fun scratching it anymore. No, and it, but but abstinence to me is so fun and people fight abstinence tooth and nail. You know, you, you've probably seen this too, where because people are so focused on weight loss. I get this all the time when people, people do very well in my program, but I'm sure they can do well in any program just to lose the weight. It's the maintenance yeah. of the weight that becomes the challenge. And it's almost like they can't wait to get back to to reintroducing these foods. And I'm like, why would you want to go back to eating foods that made you fat, sick, and addicted in the first place? It's like, they don't understand that whole concept. Yeah. I, well, some of it might just be that you're so used to being on the roller coaster of the up and down, the extremes, highs and lows, and learning how to be in that sort of uh, what we would call moderate ground um, is a new place for people. And it's, you know, it's, um, 
it's the place where you need to be if you want to put those highs and lows in the real world, like a, getting a job or, or getting a relationship or moving out of your mother's basement if you're a teenage boy smoking pot. Um, like those things are actually, uh, especially in a world where it's hard to get jobs, it's hard to get housing. It, you, you kind of make artificial highs and lows through the drug use and don't have to face the real things. But when you want to face the real things, the drug stuff is just this buffer that's in the way. Um, and it really is a buffer because the, the, the uh, courage that I need to go out and get it and, and do a job interview uh, is going to require uh, the same neurochemistry as it would be if I were to take a drug. It's going to require dopamine, which is that hunting, gathering, get out there and take my chance and adventure and find out what's going to happen. Uh, well, I can I can have that experience with an internet game and not even bother getting the job or taking a drug or having a big load of sugar. Um, you don't have to, you know, I, 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 you kind of get the same experience inside. Um, and, and if you're doing that, you don't have any leftover for out there. So not only do we have to help people quiet the internal battle with sugar, but then learn how to, I mean, dopamine is really meant to be to get us doing stuff. Mm -hmm. well, it's, it's up to us to help people now utilize that extra time and energy and desire for adventure um, in the real world where it's meant to be. And if you haven't had those skills because you didn't learn them when you were a teenager, that's when we learn those things. How to ask somebody out on a date, how to do a, a good job interview or how to talk to people in a in a smart way you know eq like an emotional quotient that stuff all happens in adolescence and and uh, if you don't have those skills you got to learn them now that's the job that we have it's not just right. stopping the sugar that's number one then it's right. how to live life I, I, feel, I feel like i've become my parents what's this world coming to <laughs> <laughs> i know yes yes and, and, you know, they had the crap growing up. I mean, of course, I, I wouldn't have got addicted to it if they didn't. But uh -huh. it didn't. It, it just seems like it's so much more pervasive now and insidious than it was even, you know, uh -huh. 60 years ago when I was growing up. Yeah, well, I think it is more pervasive now. And and because it was, I don't know if it was newer then or people noted it more now, it's become just commonplace now. Like if you're not eating, if you're not uh, drinking, if you're not doing something like, you know, then then you're an oddity yeah you know it's interesting because even though we had processed crap growing up like i remember things like tang and space food yeah. sticks and figurines my yeah. mom still cooked real food every night for dinner but yeah. now so many people like i had a client once 44 years old literally like well how do you how do you bake a potato how do you be 44 and not know how to do that, you know? Because yeah. people are using processed foods, not just as the treats that we had them, even though they weren't healthy in that manner, but yes. literally for all three meals of day. You know, you can start the day with a Pop-Tart or Lego My Ego, and yeah. then you can have like a, you know, a frozen Hot Pocket for lunch and a Swanson's TV. You, you, it's, it's possible now to make your 100% of your calories from yeah. processed food. And, and I think some people do. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, you know, you, you, you are, uh, it sounds, sounds like with your new book and, and previous stuff that you've done, um, you know, you're trying to teach people how to eat well, um, sort of adult people, how to eat well. And, you know, we're people who can reason and ration and we need guidance, but you know what we don't know. And, and I don't, I don't know if you address this in your book, we don't know how to do, do or deal with our kids because if you go to the grocery, everything for kids is, is basically dessert. Um, yeah. And, and uh, learning now how I've had patients say to me, well, I want to eat well, but I don't know what to give my kid. Like, what do I do? Um, and it has to start from there. It has to start from there. And I feel, I feel worse for the kids growing up than me growing up. Because when I grew up, I still, like you said, ate normal food and ate this stuff on the side. Yeah. Well, they're eating it now all the time. So, and uh, so we're getting people with diabetes, you know, much young. My generation, we're still getting it in our 50s. But now we're seeing it with, you know, people in their 20s and 30s. 
Yeah, absolutely. Have you ever been to a store with a kid, usually an obese child, unfortunately, that if they don't get the treat, they literally have a tantrum? I mean, I've seen that even at Whole Foods where yeah. like they'll see a cupcake or something, which may be yeah. a slightly healthier cupcake than a hostess cupcake from a gas station. But I've seen children literally flip out in grocery stores as young as, I don't know, I'm guessing three years old until they got some kind of sugary treat from their, their parents who were just besides themselves. And all that's happening is, is they're illustrating an addictive potential already at that age, which is another thing I worry about is um, what are we doing to kids when we give them this, they, they become very, their addict, addiction side becomes very developed they get older, uh, you know, a cup, a bag of cupcakes isn't going to do it anymore. They're going to have to do something else like drugs. And I worry about that as uh, sugar being a gatekeeper uh, for other drugs later. Right. You know, I, I don't know if you're familiar with Dr. Joel Furman. He wrote a, a several New York Times bestselling books uh, like Eat to Live, but his most recent one, Fast Food Genocide, and I had the pleasure of interviewing him, says that the, the kids that start out on these sugary things often do have the predisposition for, yeah. you know, pe people make light of it like, oh, it's just a cupcake, but they yeah. do, uh, their brain is being rewired unfavorably so early that they have a greater disposition to get right. addicted to more potent and dangerous drugs as they age. Yes, I, I think that that's absolutely true. And then when we throw something like marijuana in the pot, which in the pot, uh, uh, in, the, <laughs> in the whole thing, then we're going to have, it, that's that's just going to exponentiate that. And not only that, but we've been giving kids Seroquel, uh, pardon me, uh, antipsychotics, um, you know, they're, because they're starting to behave um, uh I guess in a in a not appropriate way, but that's because of the food. Like the food will um, mess up emotional so sobriety, even even from the get go, from youth, young. You know, when you have drugs that are are pumping in dopamine and serotonin and endorphins, um, uh, you're going to have a kid who is in withdrawal. Uh, six hours later, four hours later, their moods are going to go up and down and up and down. And what do we call that? We call that bipolar. We call that uh, attention deficit throw in meds, which just make it worse. Um, the simple solution would be just eat well. <laughs> yeah, or just, just, or just stop eating processed food, period. Yeah. That's the case I made in my first book that even though I happen to be vegan, the case I've been making yes. for many years is whether you're you just don't eat processed food. It's not food. Peggy yeah. comments that so many are suffering from anxiety. It's amazing how many of these suffer yeah. sufferers won't consider looking at their nutrition or should I say lack of nutrition and yes. their doctors too are saying the same thing. Oh, it doesn't matter. You know? Yes, I know. I know. Uh, and, and part of that is because it's the medical standard to uh, focus more on medication. Um, uh, part of that is the disappointment in, um, um, I mean, people, uh, doctors did preach good diet a long time ago, a lot more than they do now, but there's been a gradual, um, in the literature, you can see in the medical literature, gradually more and more over the, uh, the last few years, a sense of almost, um, not despair, but um helplessness like I don't want to bother because the patient's not going to so I'm not even going to suggest that anymore let me just pull out the prescription pad um, but part of that is I my stand is always being if we acknowledge the addictive piece that's happening that's why the patient is not following through because doctor you've been telling them to eat well but um, if they keep eating something that makes them want to eat they're gonna they're gonna say I can't do it but if you actually advise the person like you do, um, it, it's not just eating unprocessed food, but you have to watch, you have to kick out the sugar and the flour. Oh, uh, abs well, absolutely. Because I consider sugar and flour processed food. So, yeah. Exactly. Yes. Okay. Well, I mean, somebody might say honey is not. It is. It's still yeah. processed. You know, uh, it's, it's it's processed from the beehive. Like it's still sure. processed. Um, uh, but anyway, um, uh, that's the thing that, that if we don't acknowledge that, that's the thing that makes, you know, those healthy food diets fail. That That's the thing. And also there's a belief, and I can say this, I hope to you, let's have this vegan discussion. There's a belief now as veganism is becoming more and more popular, I would really like to hear a vegan person. So that could be you. Make this your next book. Um, um, just to be vegan does not mean healthy. You oh, oh I think I think I've said that quite a bit, and I hope people know that because I was the quintessential junk food fat vegan for many yes, years. Yes, yeah. but, but, and I'm seeing it so much in my uh, community um, where I don't know why. Maybe I'm just I don't know why. 
I don't know why, but anyway, I'm, I'm coming across more like new convert vegans who haven't sort of been through the mill and, and uh, figured out that uh, just to be vegan does not mean healthy. It's if you have to be a smart vegan, just like you have to be a smart anything. And, and uh, uh, eating uh, French fries does not mean that you're healthy, even though it's Absolutely. Makes, um, but that's what I see. I see uh, uh, more and more of this, well, it's vegan, so it's okay. And, and uh, that's, that's kind of missing the point. No, that's wrong. That's absolutely wrong. Absolutely. Yeah. So where do we go from here? <laughs> it, 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 you said you make that point. Do you make that point in one of your books? That that's. Um, I'm I'm pretty sure. And every time I talk, I I mean I've gonna I did a pretty well known lecture. Uh, it's on YouTube now at Dr. McDougall's conference called "From Fat Vegan to Skinny Bitch," where I did outline my whole history, and I did that. I'll send you both of my books if I can get your address in my first book on process because I was very unhealthy for the first forty three years of my life. Twenty six of them vegan, two hundred pounds, the beginning of colon cancer. So I think I did pretty much tell people that yeah that just because you're vegan doesn't mean you're healthy yeah. um, i like that's why i use the word unprocessed because then yeah. if somebody wanted to eat some animal products i still promote what i call an unprocessed or a whole food diet you know things found in nature and even that's though it. honey is found in nature yeah. you're not going to easily be able to get it <laughs> without yeah. getting Dung unless you're wearing, you know, a special uniform. So, you know, my, I, I feel like if you if it's if you can find it in nature, it's probably okay to eat. You know, there's of course always going to be a few exceptions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I you know, like Leah's, yeah, cool. Leah's saying if you had a teenager, you'd know how hard it is to get oh. them to eat this way. They will just go out for pizza. I know, I know. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to suggest because we're living in a society that just does not support this. And teenagers who are so dependent on their peers and um, are, I think, at the most risk uh, because of the environment. And they're also at the most risk because that's their brain, de their brain is developing right then. Like it's a crucial time. Um, so uh, I can give you the medical angle, but I don't know how to give the motivational side of that. I don't know. Like, I think that's a very real, I, my, you know, the only thing I can suggest, and maybe one, parents can just laugh me out of this talk. Um, I would uh, say, I know that um, if you change, not that you can't change the teenager, if you can change the environment somehow um, that teenagers live in so that you can manipulate so that they want to eat healthy, like we've seen people who are really sports minded and, you know, believe the body is the temple and all that kind of thing. They're more inclined, um, I've been told, uh, to be more careful about what they eat because they're really keen to be on the top of their game game um, physically. Uh, and, and they can do that because they're, they're hanging out with other friends who talk about that. And it, I think that the only way we're going to get anywhere is to work on that macro level, that macro societal level of making um, healthy foods sexy, mm -hmm. you know, attractive. Macho. You know, it, it's funny because the parents that really do feed their kids well, like I have a friend that's a food coach in Baltimore, Sharon McRae, and other people that are really proponents of this and that raise their kids without crap or don't let them eat crap, they yeah. get they get ostracized, like that they're creating kids with eating disorders. And that's how, and, and, and I mean, do you, I know that you've treated people with eating disorders and you probably yeah. still do, but that's not why a child gets an eating disorder because their parents made them eat, you know, kale instead of Kool-Aid. No, I know. I know that's true. Yeah. And they, and they, yes, they will say that they're, they're um, becoming too rigid and you're absolutely right. There's, there's a fall back there. Oh, it's very frustrating. Yeah. yeah. Well, you talk about the environment because, you know, everybody, by the way, every doctor I've ever interviewed talks about the importance of the environment, you know, yeah. in any addiction. And if that's the case with processed food, we're pretty much screwed. You know, with we, we can I would imagine that most parents keep most drugs and alcohol out of the home if they have young children. But uh -huh. very few people don't keep processed foods like sugar and flour out of the home. No. You know, they still think that that, that flour is healthy. Mm -hmm. it's, very, it's very difficult to explain to people that for some, though some people can't eat bread and pasta, that for somebody suffering with their weight or a food addiction, that the flour is the same as is, is booze to them. That's almost impossible. Your book does a great job at, at explaining them that, but um, like you say, we have so many mixed households. We have yeah. Well, it's usually the mother, but sometimes it's the father that comes to my group that really wants to do this. They want to lose weight and get healthy, but they're fought tooth and nail by by their their spouse or any 
children that are in the house and, and they basically just, you know, eventually give up because I, I interviewed a, a doctor today named Dr. Tom Campbell, who runs at the University of Rochester, a, a weight management and lifestyle group. And one of the things he says is if you have temptation anywhere in your environment, you'll fail. But yeah. if, if the people you're living with will not give you a supportive environment, it's like, I don't know how these people do it because I tell people I'm not perfect. My environment's perfect. That's why I'm successful. Yes. Yes. So, so, so in the way that we've done it with cigarettes, you know, like people have to go outside now to smoke their cigarettes, that that's a hassle. And yep. you know, I, I, even as an ex smoker, I'm an ex smoker. When I see somebody out there freezing, uh, smoking a cigarette, I feel sorry for them. And, and, and I have to admit sometimes now, um, uh, there's a, a little bit of disdain because it's like, haven't you been able to quit yet? Like, and so, I'm not saying that's a good thing, but what that does mean is that a person who picks up cigarettes um, no longer gets what I got when I was a teenager, which was, hey, this is cool. Like they know in some, some level that it's a sign of failure and it's it's becoming a more and more negatively tinged, which I think is the main reason that and high taxes that cigarettes have been on the out. It's, they're getting less cool. They're getting more and more like, uh, you know, you feel like a failure. If we could do the same thing for sugar, but, you know, it's so much, um, there's so much hype about how it, it's it's exciting, it's cool, it's crazy, like, like the, you just have to watch commercials. But mm -hmm. if we could somehow, um, like I'll do this sometimes around Halloween, you know, say, would you give your, your loved ones a pack of cigarettes to, you know, now you say, no, we wouldn't. Well, why are we giving them a pack of chocolates then? So to kind of twist that view of, you know, sugar is love to something, sugar is poison. Yeah. And the more that message comes out, but we're going to be fighting a big industry that doesn't want to support that. Yeah, but I, it has to be right. It'd be interesting to see, you know, if we live long enough to see that the processed food industry, specifically the sugar industry, is ever held as accountable as the tobacco industry, because yeah. so many of the uh, tobacco industries have bought, you know, companies yeah. that make sugar and flour. It's like, yeah. you you should know right there that if, if Philip Morris makes Oreos, I don't know if that's the exact company, don't yeah. eat Oreos. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's an interesting point. Absolutely. Yeah. And you're right about when smoking became a uh, it, it not it, it wasn't as glamorous and they people had to go outside and smoke i read that a lot of people just because of sheer laziness and not wanting to get in the elevator on their break and go downstairs just quit smoking for that so maybe we yeah. could have like little processed food areas like at the yes. airport where if you're eating that stuff you got to go over here and everybody's yeah. going to sugar shame you you that's know right. that's right sugar yeah. shame. There we go. Perfect. I love it. It's not, it's, it's, it's never. too bad because, because even, you know, I don't know if you've noticed this, even when people are willing to change and want to change and clean up their environment and go to some kind of a program, it's still yeah. really hard. Yeah. Yeah. It's still really hard. Um, yeah. Uh, one of the things uh, at Renaissance where we work, where I work, um, uh, we have the, a sugar addiction program uh, and um, you know, we're, we're, getting people off sugar and then we're teaching them tools about how to how to stay off sugar but we're, it's it's back to this and you have to go back to society and live in a society etc cetera, etc cetera. and and um uh um we're gonna have in september um a uh, a sort of sugar day an anti-sugar day whatever but i what what the theme is going to be called i'm naturally sweet in other words it's a power to say I don't, I don't need to smoke cigarettes. I don't need to eat sugar. I don't need, I'm good enough the way I am. And, and I think that that positive message, um, I think that's where we have to go. I think that's where we have to go. Cause the belief is I can't show you, I love you on, uh, on, on Halloween, unless I bring you a box of flowers or pardon me, a box of, of chocolates. Um, uh, I mean, I mean, that's been a manufactured market, marketable message. If we can change that to, um, it's, it's, I don't know, something else, but not that. If you know, some, is, is, your, is your sugar addiction program, is, is it a live-in program that you have at your facility? If anybody is watching in Canada, I know I have people that, that yes. follow me from Canada. So they actually, how long do they actually live there when they come to your program? program four week program and and that four weeks is plenty of time to walk out with uh having lost the craving for sugar because it actually if you stop sugar and flour and and uh if i think if you're a menopausal woman plus which 
Um, right now, it's just for women. We want to change that at some point. Um, and usually, it's women who are um, usually getting like 30s, 40s, 50s. And the menopausal women also have to stop grains often, um, just because it's it, it's advanced to that degree. Anyway, once they've done that, it only takes about 10 days. It doesn't even take the full, full four weeks. But that's when you walk out feeling really confident because you've lived already a couple of weeks without cravings. Right. And I imagine that the food there, there is not going to be anything for them to accidentally get into. To no, no, no. It's, it's very, it's very regimented. I mean, in that first week, we're actually, you know, if you go out, we're looking at your purse when you come in to make sure there's no contraband. Uh, wow, terrific. Chocolate bar or something like that. Um, and, uh, and the food that is very well designed so that it's a very nutritious food plan um, that, uh, but it doesn't have any sugar or flour or grains. And believe it or not, you can eat really well. And it is yeah. by no means a caloric restriction, by no means. Yep. People are Absolutely. eating more than they were before. Because, right. um, you know, what happens is, is sugar addicts, food addicts end up eating a ton and then they restrict and don't eat anything so that they can lose weight or save it all for night, you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And we don't allow that kind of behavior. Yes. Wow. That's unbelievable. So Peggy's asking what the contact information is for your program. If you tell me the website, I will type it in right now. Um, uh, it's a renaissance. So it's R-E-N-E-C-E-N-T, I think. Uh, probably just .ca. Um, W-W-W-R-E-N-A-S-C-E-N-T dot. C-A. Or you can just Google Renaissance Food Addiction Program and you'll get it. Okay, terrific. All right, yeah. well, we'll have you do that. Or, or I'll, I'll put it afterwards. Yeah. So uh, if, if somebody did act like you say that you let them out, but you check their purse when they come back in, yeah, that's uh, yeah. um, could they conceivably have had something off plan while they were out but not be in their purse? And if so, how do you deal with that when they've, when they've reintroduced the substance so early in their recovery? Yeah, well, I mean, they, they, they have... Um, um, jeopardize their success because if you do that, you're just you're just prolongating the agony, as it were, because it is really hard in that first ten days, and then it gets better. Um, if a person, I I'm guessing that the, um, we have not actually had very many occasions because we did this as a pilot for a year and saw like over eighty people, and and um, there were only a couple of people who and they admitted it. Um, who actually fell off plan. Most people were so desperate, they were glad to have the uh, restraints, the vis invisible restraints. Um, but if we actually saw somebody um, doing that, uh, at, 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 there's always the threat that we'll ask you to leave, but more the threat is, are you ready to be in the program? Because it's it's timely, it's, 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 it's potentially costly of your time and money and whatnot. Um, do you wanna just come back when you're ready? Like, is this an indication of not being ready? Most of the time, people haven't because they just they want it so badly that they're willing to. They'll, what they'll do is they'll just bitch about how awful they feel, but they won't actually cheat. Um, do do employers pay for a program like this? Because I I mean I know that I, I know Canada is different than the United States, yeah. but even the United States, I I've, I've known of employ employers that pay for employees drug or alcohol addiction. Yes. In places. Yeah, the employees do pay for drug and alcohol addiction, but they don't pay for this because it's not an acknowledged condition. So that's our big struggle right now, and we're still trying to figure out a way around that. But right. we have that, that's the big crux of the problem. Until this is acknowledged uh, from a medical point of view, and it's not being, you know, I don't know why. I mean, you're, you're always yeah. frustrated. Well, that would be, you know, I, I, I remember the first time I interviewed, we talked about that would be the advantage of it being in the DSM, and other people yeah. said, well, we don't want to have it as a diagnosis. And I'm thinking, but then it can be, then it can be, you know, uh, the doctors can be compensated. Because right now, for a doctor that, even if a doctor believes in lifestyle medicine or nutrition, the way doctors, most doctors are compensated is they don't have the time to educate people on these things. It takes it takes two seconds to write a prescription. It takes two hours to talk to somebody about making lifestyle change, which is why we're doing, you know, group visits or things like that. But yeah. like you say, it's... it's it, it, you know, nutrition still really isn't taught in medical school. And when it is, it's not on the board exam. So the doctors don't even have to really remember what they're taught. So, boy, yeah. we, we have a lot of work to do. It's a good yeah. thing we're healthy so we can. <laughs> and there's no there's no um, a medical piece about how, in fact, there's a medical resistance to recognizing that in the addiction compendium, food is one of the drugs. Yeah. They're Absolutely. still really kicking. They're, they're, uh, they're, they're still really fighting that one. 
Right. So how do you personally, either at the people that you work with or in the program, deal with relapse? Because I find that that's one of the most difficult things, um, you know, when people, because they beat themselves up, it seems to look like, it, however a person feels about themselves, they feel about themselves, but they, they seem to like try to be perfect, whatever that means. And they do really well on any program for a while, but mm -hmm. they hit a bump in the road, which for some people could be a, a minor slip, maybe accidentally ingesting sugar, like at a restaurant in a sauce and they can get yes. right back on plan. Some yeah. people it's, it's not accidental and it turns into a, a full blown relapse, but yeah. it seems like that the, the, it's like it, for many people, as soon as it's reintroduced, mm -hmm. it's got them again. Yeah, and they have such yeah. a hard time getting back on track. Can yeah. you explain that and what the what how people can can recover from a relapse because it seems so prevalent uh, oh it's really prevalent um i i think it's you know a, a person who slips back um if they've accidentally ingested something like it, it's not usually the very first time that you get caught it's it's the first time you have it and then you go oh that wasn't so bad maybe i can and it was kind of tasty it's a very insidious um, it's like alcohol too, in that way. Like the, the uh, it's often the second or the third time, but the first time gets you because it it fools you into thinking that it's not so bad. Um, uh, uh, so there's there's that piece. Uh, it, it it's really the the relapse is about the thinking, either yourself or the people around you, and 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 yourself because you haven't really bought that this is a problem. Sugar. Um, it, it, you know, it's it's it tastes good, and the feeling is a, a slow but gripping feeling. And um, a, any kind of addiction, it's like that. It, at least when you hit it the first time or, or relapse the first time, um, there's a kind of um, it's almost like an invisible snare that now you you find that you're caught in it, as opposed to oh wow, I better stop. Um, I don't I don't know if I can explain it better than that. Um, so that that the second time you pick up, you think, well, that wasn't so bad, or I was able to manage that, and then it's the third time, and you can't manage it anymore. Um, sometimes right. it's the first time, but it's not always. It's not always, um, and and or it's that the person was able to stop, and you know, it's their birthday, and they think it wasn't that hard, so I I'll. Do, this. do it again. And, and then maybe it's not the first time, but maybe it's the second or the fourth or the sixth. Right. That you're and again. on Monday, I'll get back and I'll start, I'll start as normal. Um, and, and then Monday never comes. And then three years yeah. and, and, and then three pounds later, they're, they're stuck back in the, the, the trap again. You know, it seems like that pe maybe it's just human nature, Dr. Tarman, but people always seem to want to push the envelope with this. Yeah, exactly. They want to push the envelope. Yes. And that's the addictive thinking that it's that pushing yeah. the envelope fooling yourself, that whole kind of connivingness. Like we talk about addiction as cunning and baffling. That's how it's cunning and baffling is it's not like this straightforward thing. Um, but you just suddenly realize, oh, no, I'm back again. And my experience is, is when you're back again, that's even harder than the first time. And the third time is even harder. And the fourth time is even harder. And then it just becomes like this this um, a fight with disappointment. Um, uh it, it, it's still doable. It just gets harder and get and well, Why do you think that is? Because I noticed that too, because, um, you know, it, like when people first join my program, they almost all of them do really well and they have success both in terms of if they're like, say, diabetic, getting off their medicine and losing weight. And yeah. then they maybe have a slip or a relapse. And then when they do get back, it's, it's, it's almost like they, they've sunk deeper into the quicksand. Yeah. And I don't know if it's just because it, 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 it it's, they're taking, they're personally beating themselves up or because maybe after a period of being away from these substances, yeah. the allure is almost even greater when you reintroduce them because then it's almost like the first time again. That's right. That's right. There is, a, there is, you know, some people who don't believe in addiction will say that that's the deprivation syndrome. You're feeling deprived. And so you want something more. And, th and there is a truth to that. Um, and in the addiction circles, they'll always say it's easier to stay than to come back, like stay instead of having to come back. And that's exactly what it is. Um, you, from a psychological point of view, you might say that that's a uh, that term that's called learned helplessness. You know, you build into um, this because this is all um, this addiction is all basically on that operant level of, of, of learning, which is subconscious, it's non intellectual, you know, it's all about um, stimulus and response, you do something, you get a response, either good or bad. And 
it, 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 you're responding from a gut level, animal level. Um, so if you learn that you're going to have a failure, then it's harder to be motivated. Um, it, it just gets harder and harder um, to fight because it's all in an unconscious level. Um, that's why it's so much better to, to get it the first time. But if you don't right, get it the right. first time, um, I don't know. I, I just keep trying. Just keep trying. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, well, listen, if they don't, if they stop trying, they're never going to get it. That we know for sure. Right. So, so right. I applaud people that, that, that keep coming back. And, you know, I've always said, you know, I've had about almost 2,400 days of abstinence. Those were the best 2,400 days of my life. I had one slip. So I don't go back. I don't, I don't go back to day one and say no. I didn't have those days. I just yeah. didn't count that one day. But I'll tell you what I learned from that experience is that it is a lot easier to just stay compliant than yeah. to keep having to trying to get compliant at yeah. get, regain compliance after a slip. And a lot of people fight this whole concept of abstinence. It's not sexy. It's not fun. It's too restrictive. It's mm -hmm. the only thing that's ever worked for addiction. If, yeah, that's it. If, if, if yeah. somebody could come up with a, another solution that we, you yeah. and me can have, you know, candies, cakes, cookies, pies, and ice cream all day and yeah. still be a, at a normal weight without health challenges and still have our calm, stable brain, please, please write yeah. me because I'd be happy to do that program. But I don't think it exists. No, I mean, let me just uh, say something about that idea about um, – abstinence versus the occasional intentional slip because you have to allow yourself to have a break once in a while. I mean, what we're trying to do here is recalibrate our natural reward pathway, our natural, because, you know, drugs, food are um, giving us an overindulgence of dopamine um, or, or whatever other en endorphins or something like our, our, our feel good chemicals. And, and uh, when that happens, the, the brain will adjust to um, that overabundance, which we call tolerance. And that's why we need that to feel better. And if you don't have it, then you get depressed. I mean, we know that if, if, if you're trying to quit that substance, um, you're going to go through withdrawal and, and and that withdrawal would only be 10 days and then it would be peaceful because you will have recalibrated back to normal, which is really what you were trying to do when you were eating the sugar after a while. You just don't want to feel bad, so you keep eating. If you can get back to normal, then you're fine. You don't need it. But if you keep reintroducing it, you're going to have to keep in withdrawal. And so you're in perpetual withdrawal. And and uh, um, that doesn't – I don't I – don't, unless you just like a crisis lifestyle, it's not good. <laughs> You get the abundance, you get the withdrawal, the, the brain never gets a chance to recalibrate because you re keep reintroducing the drug that upsets the apple cart. Um, uh, so so um, abstinence is a way of just sidestepping that whole thing. And, and it's not a boring place to be because we're built to, to um, have a normal, happy life. Like it, we're meant to have that. <laughs> When, when people um, are in withdrawal, they don't feel that. And if they are continually cheating, they'll never feel what I'm talking about or what you're talking about. Yeah, they absolutely. Get it. Because they never it get it. It kind of reminds me of uh, Elizabeth Taylor when she played Maggie on Cat on a Hot Tin Roof when she said, I could never keep my finger off a saw. Because a oh. lot of people can't keep their mouth off a cookie. And, and I get it because I was like that for, for, for most of my life. So yeah. we have a couple of great questions live that I'd like to ask you. They're both similar. And we and I'll ask them both because they're, they're very similar. So Heather, who's lost 300 pounds, mm. says, if you have any tips when you can't control your environment, your work environment, because she controls oh. your environment perfectly. And yeah. then Andy, who is a nurse, asks if you see a lot of nurses in your program, because she says in her situation, there's a constant flow and consumption of junk food in almost all yeah. nursing situations. So so the oh. question is, is what do you do when you're not at home, to, to when you're constantly being triggered and exposed to these unnatural drug-like foods? That uh -huh. you're to? I, uh, well, I think you have to create an artificial environment within that, that, that environment, which in... in uh, uh, I mean, that's that's a lot of what uh, 
follow-up groups, either 12-step groups or, or um, groups like online groups, would be talking about exactly that. What do I do in this scenario? How do I maintain abstinence? How do I give myself that protective cushion of abstinence in this artificial environment? Um, and so that might be when I go into work, I have my own food and I don't go into the into the staff room. I, I know like at the emergency uh, ward, like it's, it's considered a really nice thing if one of the staff brings in a a bag of we have them timbits i don't know if you have them but they're 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 you know little cookie things or little donut things um and that's considered a nice thing well you know like you said earlier you have an area where that stuff is kept and where those people sit and and if you can't control that you can at least move out of that environment you can have your own food um uh, but, but i mean these are deliberate intentions to create I call it like an artificial cushion or or balloon or something within that environment, and that's going to feel unnatural. But uh, you know, people will eventually accept that that's what you do. Yeah, they would do that if you were um, you had some kind of illness, if you had cancer or something, you couldn't eat particular foods. People would, or or just allergies, people would respect that. Right. Um, so you're gonna you'd have to do something like that. Yeah, you know, I was I was I was filming a television show in Los Angeles yesterday, mm. and I was on set for almost ten hours. Now I've been in the habit of bringing my own food yes. forever. Even even before I was vegan, we were kosher, uh, and so I learned at an early age that yes. the world is not set up to serve AJ and her unique needs. Yes. I also have food allergies, including one to black pepper, which is pretty much in a lot of things. Uh, and then when I became vegan, and then when I became um, yeah you know, abstinent. So yeah. I've had a, I've had a long history of, of bringing my food with me. So it's never a problem. So I brought my food with me enough for a whole day. Cause I was gone a, a whole yeah. day and, and what they served on craft services. Like you say, they were non edibles. It was, there was all processed stuff. I always make sure I never leave my house without my cooler purse or some food, yeah. but, but what, yeah. you know, like, like, Okay, so to give you the analogy, a lot of people, I, I, I'm going to play devil's advocate because there are people out there like my husband who yeah. can have a dessert and mm -hmm. he's slim and he's healthy. And, and most of the time he'll choose fruit. But if somebody gave him a vegan cupcake for his birthday, he'd probably eat it because he's one of these people that doesn't want to offend people. And he has no problem going back to steamed vegetables for breakfast the next day. Uh -huh. Just like there are some people that can have an alcoholic beverage often or occasionally and not be alcoholics. Yeah, yeah. And I hear them say, well, but that's your problem. Why should we have to change? Now, in a work environment, I mean, uh -huh. unless you work in a bar or a restaurant, you can't have alcohol. Mm -hmm. If you smoke cigarettes, you can't smoke at work because mm -hmm. that could affect somebody else with allergies. So mm -hmm. how, how can we change? See, I'm so... I think the, I'm so blessed because I don't have to have coworkers. Yeah. I mean, I used to, I used to be a respiratory therapist. I've been a bank teller, but yeah. I don't know how these people with coworkers do it. Yeah. The climate is so pervasive there. I don't know how they do it. Is there a way to change the climate? Because well, human resources, their employees would be healthier. Yeah. And it's, again, we're not telling the employees they can't eat the crap. We're mm -hmm. telling them just like if they smoke cigarettes, they have to go outside and do it so that they're not bothering someone else. But it, they, they remember how, uh, I remember in my generation as a child, it, to eat um, outside of meals was, was considered impolite. And you yeah. never ate if somebody else beside you didn't have food. That was just considered impolite. So the mores have changed. And they've changed in such a way that you eat all the time now, or you can, including patients coming in with all their chips and stuff in front of me eating. Um, I'm doing a group and they're pouring out their, their candies uh, to eat. And that, that would have been unheard of. So, so if we, we can change the mores, the environmental um, uh, things, just by socially condoning or not condoning behavior, which has changed. We've seen it. Uh, um, I don't, how, how can we make that go back? We have to make it sexy. We have to make it attractive to go back to, um, um, we don't eat except at meals or whatever it is that we did in those, in those days. Now it's changed. Yeah. I, you know, like something's changed there. The, I, and I think it has to be on that level that there has to be change so that when you walk into a workplace, um, uh, it's it, what you eat is private. It's not public and expected that everybody eat. That's the same thing. 
Oh, well, you know, I think if I ever had to get like a real job with uh, with coworkers, I would talk to whoever's in charge mm-hmm. and explain and, and maybe show them your book or one of these videos to try to get the, the climate change. You know, I understand when somebody's an employee, they often can't do that. But I have people in my program that literally own the company uh, and they could make it a rule that yeah. these foods don't exist. And they still still own yeah. Do, do you notice that a lot of uh, most of the people I work with are women, maybe you too, but they, yeah. they tend to be very agreeable people pleasing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, it's, it's lack of boundaries. It's lack of, a lack of boundaries, but I do think that there's some of it that's mores too, you know, mm-hmm. you change, just change the values of that area. Um, I think that's where it would have to start actually. In your, in your program, do you teach people like how to talk to their family members that just don't get it so that they can respectfully ask for a change in environment? Because that seems to be the hardest thing is, um, is, they, is their husband or their children say, no, well, why should I have to eat the crap outside the house? I, I make the money. I want to eat this crap, even yes. though it's causing you to be fat and sick and unhappy. Yes, that's right. Yes, I, that, uh, that, that's a key piece because that's a, when, when you asked about uh, a cause of relapses or just the concept of relapse, there's the relapse of yourself fooling yourself into thinking that you can get away with wine. And then there's the whole area of the, the social, the inability to control or live in the social environment and you have to say no. Um, and that's extremely, yes, you have to learn how to man, you have to learn how to navigate that. And it's, it's not even so much people, we are people pleasers we, uh, by nature, by nature of being human beings, we want to please people. Um, it, it's a social skill. It's, it's a survival skill. Um, uh, but, but there, you can still learn how to um, set boundaries in that context. It doesn't have to be aggressive, but it can, it, it, yes, it, it's, a, yes, it's something that we do. We could could you give me like a give, give me like one tip or trick that you tell your patients on how to get the crap out of the house with a resistant family? Like, could you just give me like one little? Trick um, well, it, it it might be um, that uh, if you're going to eat that stuff, you have to eat that in another room, or you have to put that in an area where I'm not aware of it, or you have to cook it when I'm not around. Um, uh, if if um, if it's like a buffet kind of thing. Um, I'm going to get you to get my plate. I'll tell you what I want and you get it and bring it to me. Um, I think it's mainly more just uh, honor that uh, you can eat that stuff, but don't eat it in my face. And if you're going to eat, we won't be eating together. Um, uh, I mean, in in my specific case, I don't really mind if the person's eating it with me, um, but I don't want to smell the cooking. That's really hard, the smell. I find smell very triggering. Um, I don't want to see it late at night when I'm trying to um, read a book to fall asleep because my my um, uh, um, defenses are down. Uh, so the last thing I want to do is see my partner beside me, you know, snacking on a chocolate bar late Absolutely. at night. That no. would, that would, I would if my husband didn't support me, I don't think I would have been successful. I, yeah. you know, because the yeah. minute I learned about food addiction and had my first appointment with a food addiction expert, and basically I was told I needed to quit my job as a pastry chef and get all the crap <laughs> out of the house. I yeah. did that. First, he didn't understand. He would try hiding things in our small apartment. But even if he doesn't understand, he loved me and he respected me. And that's why I don't understand how some spouses and children can be so hostile. Because I just thought if you love somebody and they have a disease, you would we would want to support them just because you yeah. love them, even if you didn't understand it. Yeah, but maybe, maybe I don't know. Um, uh, I, I, I would think that part of it might be that they feel threatened that they have to stop. So if you can assure them you can do it, I just don't want to be around you when you do it, then that's right. fine. You know, nice. Yes. And can, can we keep it separate? Like you keep it somewhere else and I don't know where it is and you just do it when I'm not around. Um, and that's at least then there's a compromise that's made. But I think something like that must be done, must be. And, yeah. and if there's a deliberate, like I remember once um, people laughing and deliberately teasing and tempted me, come on, this is delicious, have this. I mean, that's just, that's just uh, you just deal with that as the aggression that it is or yeah. teasing, taunting that it is. Yeah. Angela is saying that the reason that family members do that is because they're addicted too. Yes, yes, you're right. The addict doesn't want to be reminded. Yes. Yeah. And a lot of people um, have developed relationships where they're co-addicts together. Right. Um, 
uh, or friendships where, you know, you're food buddies together. You know, you cook this one week and, you, and I'll cook this next week and you share, you share a binge fest and that's going to change. And it, yes, it will. It will change. Nice. Like, you can't go and well, see your drinking buddies. You're not going to eat your, see your food buddies. Absolutely. And it's interesting because with alcohol, at least I, I don't know a, a lot of alcoholics. I'm sure you know many more because you run a treatment center. Yes. But for the few I've met, they were once they got clean and sober, they were no longer able to hang around their friends that were still drinking. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. And yet, but with food, well, especially if they're in your family, it's going to be a lot harder unless you like, you know, divorce your husband or leave your children. I get that. But, but you're so right because so many relationships are built on the foundation of any addiction. And, yeah. uh, yeah. and if you stop using, you know, you're no longer fun to your friends. Yes. Yes. It's, it's, it, and that's, and you know, because, because food has such a, um, it's not seen with the same severity, then people will say, can I leave this relationship, leave this family member right. uh, for this? Because come on, it's not that bad. Because you know, the death and the disease and the destruction that occurs to your life isn't until later. It's all very slow and it's under, under the radar. Until we have the radar up in our face like we now have with cigarettes, I mean, you know, people smoked all the time and people would drop off with cancer and we just kind of shrug and not re now it's so obvious. Um, but and, 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 and I mean, really, we are like like we were with cigarettes in the 1950s or something like that. We're just kind of getting it, but not really. But one right. day it's gonna become really obvious. This isn't going to happen tomorrow. It's going to happen in 10 years. Um, and. Uh, well, maybe, maybe you and I should start a march on Washington, D.C. I would because love to. You know, I that because how else are we going to get this out? You know, people yeah. say that it's not a disease or doesn't take it seriously. Yes. They obviously haven't met anyone who's either contemplated, attempted, or committed suicide because yeah. of this. Yeah. You know, well, they, and they, I have all three met people they, of all. Three. But, you know, they have. But you know what they do with those people? They say that they're depressed. And so they give them meds. They they are depression because they are inherently depressed. They are themselves, not because of the food. Um, or they say that they're um, unmotivated and they're obese and they should just stop eating and get on a diet. Um, or they should there um, go and have a bariatric surgery. Um, yeah. Like like they see that, but but they don't they, because they're not getting this dynamic. There's all sorts of solutions that are not getting the point. I would love to have a, a march. Love all right, it. well, let's talk offline and figure out how we can have a march on Washington D.C. That, that's part yeah. of what I want to do in September. We're gonna we're gonna get uh, a couple of really big, uh, good speakers coming up. I don't know, you know Robert Lustig, don't you? I've heard of him. I've never met him. Sure. Yeah, he's gonna come up because he's the guy that talks. He's the guy. Uh, he's, you got to get him on your show. He'll come on your show. You got to okay. get him on the show. I don't know how to reach him, but sure. I'll give you his uh, his, his contact. Um, he's the guy that, that that's working on the policy level of how to make. He actually doesn't really buy food addiction, but he gets sugar. He's the guy that talks a lot about the dangers of sugar, and he did the the YouTube uh, viral um, YouTube the sugar the bitter truth. He, that's him, um, and uh, uh, he will trash sugar to the nth degree and and on a political level. So he's going to come up here, and we're going to try to do something. But I would love to do an actual march. That's because that's noticeable, and right. people laugh at us. But they'll laugh at us only the first couple of years. At that's some okay. Point, take us they always say that when change, you know, first it's ridiculed before it's accepted. Do you exactly. ever come? States, because I would love to hear you speak in person. Do you ever have a chance to come to the United States and do any? Yeah, sure, sure. I, I do go to the States. You're not in New York, are you? I love New York. I'm in, I'm in Los Angeles, but boy, oh, I'd love to come and meet Los Angeles. Okay. okay. I haven't been there. Just oh, I, I, I wish I had a conference right now to hire you to speak at because you're, you're just ah. wonderful. Well, I, I could talk to you about this all day and maybe we will do a March, you guys. So yes. uh, thank you so much, Dr. Tarman, for your time and your expertise and your passion. And everybody, make sure you get Dr. Tarman's book, Food Junkies, yes. especially if you have a loved one that doesn't understand. It's not only a terrific read, but it's an even better listen, in my opinion. You can do both. I've listened to it probably three times on Audible. So thank you so much, Dr. Tarman. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Healthy Living Live. I'm Chef AJ, and I make abstinence taste delicious. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Thanks.